In 1776, the people of the 13 colonies in America felt that they needed just a little bit more independence from Britain than they had had up to that moment. On the 4th of July that year, they issued their Declaration of Independence. These are the famous words that begin the second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Whatever you think about the Declaration and the list of rights that are included, what's really interesting is the order of words. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The right to life comes before everything else. If you're not alive, you have no rights or duties. There is nothing to defend, nothing to fight for. It's the same with the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights from the United Nations. Article 3 states, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. The rights are slightly different, but the order is the same. It has to start with life. Christian teaching speaks about the dignity of the human person. Human beings have a special place in creation. We are persons, not things, with a body and a soul, with freedom and intelligence, with creativity and a conscience. Even if you don't believe in God, you can believe that human life has a special value, an intrinsic worth. This is why we shouldn't treat people as objects or as means to an end. Their dignity does not depend on what other people think about them. It doesn't depend on their gifts or abilities. It depends on their humanity. This dignity can never be taken away. That's why we should honor someone's life from beginning to end, from conception to their natural death. This is what it means to respect the sanctity of life. Two experiences come to mind when I think about these things. When I was a student, I spent a summer volunteering with Mother Teresa's sisters in North London. They ran a soup kitchen and a hostel for homeless people. I've never chopped so many carrots or prayed so many rosaries. But what touched me was the way the sisters treated each person. They never turned anyone away, no matter how difficult the situation. People were often filthy from living on the streets. Many of them had serious mental health problems. The sisters showed such kindness to each individual. There was no pretense. The dignity of the human person was not just a theory, it was a living reality. The second experience was soon after I had become a priest. One of the mothers in the church where I worked had a very difficult pregnancy, and she ended up having a premature birth when the child was just 23 weeks along. I went to visit her the next day in the neonatal ward at St. Mary's Hospital in Paddington. It was the smallest baby I had ever seen. What moved me was not just the concern of the parents, I expected that. It was the care of the whole neonatal team. The whole medical unit was focused on these tiny babies who had nothing to give except their being, their life itself. This team understood the meaning of human dignity. And yes, the baby made it and was sitting in the church with her parents a few months later. In the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament, God said to Moses, you shall not kill. It's sometimes translated as, you shall not murder. We have a right to self-defense, but it's wrong to directly and intentionally kill an innocent human being. This is why Catholic teaching forbids murder, abortion, euthanasia, and suicide. Some people, of course, are not fully aware that something is wrong or not fully responsible for their decisions and some situations get so complicated that it's not clear what the right way forward is. 
we should always have compassion and never be quick to judge others in difficult situations. But the teaching is clear and it's there to defend human dignity and to protect innocent human life. There are so many other ways that we can defend human dignity. The right to life is not the only human or Christian value, but the foundation of every other human right and human dignity is the right to life, which is why the dignity of the human person is the most important place to start. My husband is really good at anticipating what I need, um, particularly we're in the early days of parenthood. He's really good at uh, looking after me as well. I'd have to say my mum, and that's because from a young age she got us really involved in working with vulnerable groups, um, particularly people with learning disabilities. And also she'd, most of the time, always put other people and us before herself. Typical mum. I have a friend who, when you speak to her, she always gives you 100% of her attention. She always really listens, and I think that this ability to be really present to a person is a sign of how caring and compassionate she is. My mom is, is amazing, and she always loving, always there, always caring for me, my, my siblings, and. Um, and especially as an Italian, food and filling you and loving you. It has to be my mentor and friend called Pippa. She, um, she gives me the best advices and she's completely present when she speaks to me. Uh, my husband. <laughs> and that is because um, I would say I can be really horrible. <laughs> and no matter what, um, no matter how horrible I can be, he can, shows, he can show a love that um, I've never witnessed before. As Christians, how do we live our faith in the world? Well, there's a paradox. On the one hand, we're called to build up the kingdom of God, to make the world a better place. There is work to do. On the other hand, our true home is in heaven. We know that everything in this world will pass away. We're waiting for the new Jerusalem that was promised to us in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. You might have heard this saying before, act as if everything depended on you, pray as if everything depended on God. This is why we have seven days in the week. There are six days for working and one day for resting and reflecting. Of course, it doesn't always work in a tidy way like this, but we need to have some way of handing everything over to God and remembering that only he can bring it to fulfillment. The Catholic Church has developed a great body of social teaching to help us understand what makes a good and healthy society. One of the key themes is balance. It's about individual human rights and the rights of the family and society. It's about the rule of law and the right to conscientious objection. There is a place for private property and there is a place for recognizing the common good of wider society. There is clear teaching about the rights of workers and about our duty to care for the sick, the stranger, the prisoner, and the poorest of the poor. You see all this exemplified in the evangelical Christianity of William Wilberforce. He was horrified by the injustice of slavery 
He spent his whole political life working for the abolition of the slave trade. This commitment flowed out of his religious conversion and his desire to put his faith into practice. Personal faith and a commitment to the common good of society went hand in hand for him. Catholic social teaching also involves caring for the environment. This is what Pope Francis calls an integral ecology, an integral ecology, where justice, human rights, and concern for the poor are intertwined with a concern for nature, the environment, and the whole of creation. Everything connects. There are religious implications too. As a Christian, I have a responsibility to build up the kingdom of Christ and to infuse society with a Christian spirit. I also have a responsibility to respect the religious freedom of those who do not share my faith. So there is a really solid body of social teaching here based on the Bible and 2,000 years of Christian experience. But it doesn't mean everyone thinks or acts in the same way. You can have two Catholics, two Christians, who disagree very strongly about politics or practical policies. They will often have different priorities. What matters is that they are inspired by the same core Christian values. We learn these values as we grow up, especially in the family. And if we don't, we struggle. This is why the institution of the family is so important. It's the fundamental unit of society where we learn how to love and relate to one another. In the family, we learn the basic social values of freedom, generosity, fraternity, justice, forgiveness. And this helps us to build a just and generous society. A few days after Christmas, my sister told me that Thomas, my little nephew, had been trying to share all his Christmas presents with his big sister. He didn't want to keep anything for himself. OK, he was probably just copying the example of his parents. Maybe he thought it was just a game. But he was learning the habit of sharing. He was learning the virtue of generosity. That same day, I read in the newspaper that a student had helped a woman give birth on the platform of the local underground station. He'd heard some screaming in the distance, and instead of walking away, he'd gone to see if anyone needed help. Five minutes later, he was holding a newborn baby in his arms. It struck me that somewhere, probably in his home, this young man had learnt to look out for others. He had an instinct to help, and it led to this heroic moment on the tube. I'm guessing he owed a lot to his family and his upbringing. Now, life is complicated, and families are often complicated. But that doesn't stop us recognising what a special gift it is when children can be brought up with the love of their mother and father, within the commitment and stability of marriage, and with a spirit of generosity and joy in their home. The Christian family has so much to offer society because it can become a place of faith and hope and Christian love. That's not to judge other families, but just to acknowledge that the love of Jesus Christ really can make a difference to our lives and then to the lives of the people we meet. The main thing that comes to mind is, is a society that's focused on, on the individual person, the individual human, that we want that each individual to flourish and to, and to live well. 
If it's centered on that, I think the I think it'd be beautiful. I guess it's community, really. Um, if you have a sense of community that doesn't necessarily that doesn't exclude anyone, then that's what builds kind of like a better world. I think people need to care to the same extent, at least, um, about other people around them and also just around the area and like the atmosphere um, and environment they're in. We'd love in a different way. We'd look after each other differently. I, I think a sense of tradition and, and the ability for everyone to participate in that tradition and to, to, to pass it on to children and grandchildren and you know, people in hundreds of years time. I think a, society, a good society is one that has a memory um, as well as a happy experience of the present. There are many things that make a good society, but I think one of the major things, at least for me, is people being involved. I think empathy, and I understand that as the capability of putting human value before economic value uh, whenever it's needed. One day, when I was a student, I was rushing through the town centre at lunchtime. I saw a homeless person collapsed on the ground in front of me. I was distracted and didn't have time to think, so I just stepped over him. And I don't mean I walked around him, I literally stepped right over him and walked on. It was about ten steps further on that I began to process what had happened. I kept walking, but there was this weight within me, like a physical heaviness. I just knew it was wrong to ignore someone in such need, however busy I was, and my steps got slower and slower and slower. Eventually, I stopped in my tracks and turned around. He was still there. I went back and sat with him for a while. He came round. We talked. We managed to contact someone he knew and he found somewhere safe to stay that afternoon. I'm not pretending I was some sort of hero. It, it's exactly the opposite. I didn't care. But even when I had walked on, I couldn't get rid of this voice within me. I think it was the voice of conscience. Our moral conscience in the Christian understanding calls us to do good and to avoid evil, to do the right thing and avoid what is wrong. It's not just a feeling or an instinct, it's like an understanding or an inner voice. It speaks to our freedom, it connects us with the goodness of God. We have a duty to follow our conscience. If we don't, something within us can never settle. We might pretend that everything is fine, but there is an inner conflict. We lose our spiritual peace and our integrity. We also have a duty to form our conscience and to grow in virtue. Most of us inherit a lot of assumptions and prejudices and pick up a lot of bad habits along the way. So we need to deepen our understanding about what is truly right and wrong. For a Christian, this involves prayer and listening to the Holy Spirit. It involves studying the Bible and following the teaching of the church. Conscience is not just an inner voice, it's an openness to the truth, wherever that can be found. It's an openness to Jesus Christ, ultimately, who is the way, the truth, and the life. St. Thomas More gave a great example of following conscience, whatever the cost. He was a lawyer and scholar in the 16th century and became England's most senior politician. But he came into conflict with King Henry VIII over the question of divorce and the unity of the church. Many of his friends encouraged him to agree with the king. He tried to find a compromise, but he felt he couldn't swear to something or sign something if he believed it was untrue. He couldn't betray his conscience. So King Henry had him executed in the Tower of London.
The truth is such an important value and one that is often devalued today. There is so much fake news in the media and we can all become very casual about the truth. We cut corners and tell white lies and sometimes we can get tangled up in terrible lies. Christian teaching is very clear and it follows the Ten Commandments in the Bible. You must not bear false witness against your neighbour. It's wrong, in other words, to lie. We're called to seek the truth and to speak truthfully. Now, it doesn't mean that in every situation we're required to share the whole truth. It depends on the circumstances. And not everyone has a right to know what we're thinking. But we must avoid outright lies. Sometimes the truth requires us to speak up. St. Oscar Romero was a priest in El Salvador who had a great love for Christ. Through the 1970s, he became more and more aware of the hardship of the poor and the violence of the government security forces. In 1977, he was chosen to be Archbishop of San Salvador. The political conflict was intensifying. There was electoral fraud, torture, government-sponsored death squads. Archbishop Romero became the voice of the voiceless. He spoke out against the killings and the injustice from the cathedral pulpit. And he kept speaking even when the death threats multiplied. On the 24th of March, 1980, Romero was shot and killed while he was celebrating mass. He was a martyr for truth, for justice, and for conscience. I hope that I will never have to face the horror that Oscar Romero faced, but I also hope that I would have the same love that motivated him, the same passion for truth and justice, and the same willingness, when the moment comes, to stand up for my conscience and for the truth. Absolutely, all the time, no matter what. Um, even if the consequences of uh, you telling the truth are not the best, or they don't look the best at first, but in a sense, the reward of telling the truth will come back to you. Maybe not directly, not straight away, but at a later stage, I would say. Yes, always. I think you should never lie. You shouldn't necessarily tell people things that they don't have the right to know, but I don't think you should lie. Does it constitute lying if you're you know, planning a surprise party or trying to keep something from someone but for their own benefit. Yes, I think so. Um, I think we should always speak the truth, but we don't always have to speak. I don't know. I, I can think of situations where the truth would, would be unwise or hurtful. Um, but, yeah. But I also, it kind of seems like a good thing to do, to be honest, so... Yes, always, always tell the truth. It, it's a beautiful thing. I think everybody likes to hear the truth. If not at first, to know that people are being honest with us. We, we want that. Uh, but, and I can't, I can't not be honest and truthful. Like, it doesn't even sit well in me if I, if I have held back or haven't been honest. If you're lying to save a life, for example, but I think that there should always be truthfulness in everything you're doing and everything you're saying. Yes, um, but we need to learn how to tell the truth in a loving way. 